So I have, I think, for older games and consoles, and I have a bunch of them. However, I also love computers of all shapes and sizes. So I think it's about time these hobbies of mine get more intimate in the weirdest way possible. Now I made some experiments building computers into different 3D printed cases. For example, I've done projects where I stuck a netbook, motherboard and screen into a Macintosh-like case. And I've also put a small SBC Windows 11 PC into a tiny Mac Pro case. But this time I wanted to honor one of my favorite console designs ever by combining it with some PC guts and peripherals. Now, taking working hardware from the 80s and hacking it up to do a random Frankenstein project really isn't something I'd like to do, not to mention I'd get ripped apart by my audience, so I looked into some shell alternatives. And while you can get third-party shells of various colors and quality on sites like AliExpress, I came across a 3D printed project on Thingiverse and I was really curious as how that would turn out. While you can't print this out yourself, depending on the size of your printer and the quality of materials you use, this might actually be quite challenging. So I've decided to go with my go-to source for 3D prints, which is GLC 3DP. I've mentioned them a bunch in my previous projects, and that's because the quality and the overall experience is just above what I was able to get with any home-based printers. They do outstanding professional work with variety of materials, and it's super easy to get your prints made. Just go to their website, upload your STL or other design files, select your preferred color, material, type of finish and so on, and in no time at all you'll get your beautiful prints for whatever project you might do. This is the third time I've made something using their services and I'm always impressed by the result. I mean look at this, it looks like something that came out of an ABS mold from the factory. So if you need anything 3D printed or you have a PCB design you'd like made, check these guys out using a link in my video description. Right, so we're not going to be using an original shell, but rather this 3D printed variant, and it's a one-to-one -one copy, so if you have a damaged shell or you just like a custom one, this is a great alternative. However, the way I had it printed, it was just a basic off-white finish, no colors, so we'll have to do some customization in order to get it a bit closer to the original, but we'll get to that after figuring out what computer parts should we put in there. Now, for my previous builds, I've used a netbook motherboard and a tiny modern SBC computers, but for this one I had a specific PC in mind, and for that we'll have to go to Schwabeck storage unit where we have... computers. <laughs> and parts. Lots of them. Somewhere on this shelf is a thin client type PC I remember getting in a lot ages ago and I wanted to see if it works because it kinda seemed perfect for the job, but before we can use it we'll have to test it first. There was literally no information about it anywhere on the case, like <laughs> no manufacturer info, no specs, logos, there wasn't even anything about the power input, which is important since this thing uses DC and there's a little supply converter board inside and I had no idea what to actually feed this thing. So I took the case apart in search of some more info and while getting inside was easy again I was stumped by the lack of information. I determined this thing used an ASRock 8410PV mini ITX motherboard with a little power board but again no info on the power input. After a bit of searching online, I was unable to find this exact PC or any of the specs. However, I did find some other thin clients using the same motherboard, and some of them use 19 volts, like what you'd use with a typical laptop, or 12 volts, which also made sense since that's what the motherboard itself uses, along with 5 volts and 3.3 volts. So I've tried with both voltages to see if it would turn on on React in any way, but unfortunately, no luck. After checking the voltages on the 24 pin connector I could see that something was definitely wrong with the power delivery since the voltage wasn't being stepped down to correct values and it was all out of whack. Checking the board in a bit more detail I could see that some of the capacitors were rusty and slightly bulged so since there were only 10 of them I decided to spend some time desoldering them and replacing them with brand new ones. These ones were unfortunately slightly larger, but of correct specs, but of course after retesting the voltages there was no change. <laughs> so yeah, despite what people tell you, replacing caps doesn't always solve your issue, and I've just wasted my time and patience with this little board. There's probably some other component, possibly a transistor or inductor that has failed, but by this point I have already rage quit this guy and decided on using another PC as my base. Well, PC is probably not the best way of describing it since it's actually a Mac. 
Yeah, if you remember, I've gotten a bunch of these months ago for very cheap, and I've done a couple of videos and experiments with them, but I still have a bunch left, so I've decided to put this one to some good use. I've started by stripping it down to the bare components, and yeah, one reason I wanted to use that other PC is that unlike this Apple crap, it's far more modular, having industry standard sockets, pins, and headers, so that you can rearrange components as you see fit. With this, you're stuck with Apple's proprietary design, but we'll make it happen regardless. And yeah, while the Mac Mini isn't horribly difficult to take apart, there were still times where I... struggled. Who the fuck spot welds their freaking I.O. shield? Son of a bitch. Come on, man. Who does that? After a while though, I had a thing stripped down to bare components, which were the motherboard, fan, hard drive, and that optical drive, along with things like sensors and antennas. And instead of attaching those drives to like a standard SATA connector somewhere on the motherboard, there's a custom interconnect board which connects to that HDD, slimline ID, optical drive and the audio in and out ports. Because Apple. However, I was really in luck because, I kid you not, that drive was the exact same width as the opening slot for the game cartridges, and in exactly the right position too. I mean, within like a millimeter, like it was meant to be. The board was also smaller than the ASRock ones, so that would give me a bit more room to work with. Also, the RAM set flush, and overall it turned out to be a better suited option. After making sure it all still worked after taking all the components out, it was time to do some modification to the case pieces itself, since even though the motherboard was a great fit as far as dimensions go, there were still things I had to tweak. In particular, there were a couple of plastic screw posts that were in the way, so I used my little Dremel-like tool to cut those off, and I also made a little slot for the I.O. ports, and I did that to both the lower part of the clamshell and the top one, so that it would fit flush. And yeah, that worked out great, and afterwards I needed to figure out where and how to mount some of the other parts of this build, starting with the fan. And again, conveniently, there was enough room for it to fit next to the board, where there were already some holes for the Nintendo's internal I.O., so I've decided to cut a square slot there. The fan fit beautifully, and there'd be plenty of room for it to suck the air in and blow it out the back there. Next, I wanted to utilize those front controller port holes, since even though I wasn't planning on using the original controllers, I still thought it'd be cool to have like a couple of USB slots there, not just for aesthetics, but also functionality. I could hook up some USB game controllers, for example. And I looked through my pile of parts and computers and found a couple of USB headers that fit that hole snugly, but couldn't really find two matching ones, so I settled on this USB hub I found and decided to use it instead of the headers, since it's not like I have anywhere to plug them in either. And while I could route this somehow through the back and plug it into one of the USB ports, I thought that was kind of clunky. So again, since Apple didn't give us any extra USB headers on the motherboard, I had to solder the end of the cable to one of the existing ports, or pins I should say. There are four wires, including ground, 5 volts, and data plus and minus, and once I had them all soldered up, I tested everything with a mouse and, yep, worked perfectly, which meant I had those ports covered now. The last bit of external work were those holes for the power and reset buttons, and I was beating myself silly thinking about how I'll go about utilizing those, until I figured I actually had some NES parts somewhere. <laughs> so I decided to use the actual NES switch assembly instead of 3D printing the switches and fumble around with making it all work. I've used my multimeter to map out where each of the wires went, and then I soldered up the switch, as well as that LED, so that it would come on when the system was powered up. Okay, so I actually did most of the um, electrical stuff and cutting, I think, that I need to do. So I wanted to kind of walk you through this whole package and show you what I did. So we have the two halves of the shell cut and it fits nicely now, along with that exhaust on the back, which blows the air out here. And then instead of making a custom switch or something for the front, I've actually taken an extra uh, switch assembly from the original NES that I just happen to have. And so I've actually wired it up so that the unit turns on with the original power button, which is cool. The only difference is the original power button is like a momentary switch, and this is a push um, on-off switch. So what I need to do is to 
click it and then unclick it and that makes it turn on. I've also wired in the original uh, red LED and I did that by uh, taking 5 volts from this um, IR sensor here and I've actually wired it in uh, using some resistors to drop the voltage down to something that this LED can actually handle. And that's basically it. At this point, I need to start thinking about how I will mount these things more permanently. And I have a couple of things, for example, this speaker, some of these uh, sensors. This is a temperature sensor that I need to mount somewhere on here. And I actually do have quite a few mounting posts that I'll try to utilize, um, but we'll see how that goes. After assembling the whole thing temporarily, it was time to see how it would all look, and more importantly, would it all work? And yeah, just seeing this thing even at this stage was enough to make me giggle. It looked pretty cool already, and yep, it was all working as intended, including the optical drive slot, which was to me at least the coolest part of this thing. <laughs> That's cool, man. <laughs> uh. With the technical bit taken care of, it was time to move on to the exterior look of the console or computer. That involved some paint and I went looking trying to find the right shade of that NES grey we're all familiar with and I took my time at the hardware store going through all the various types of spray paints. In the end I've settled on these ones and, you know, these consoles have various shades depending on their age and stages of yellowing, so even if it's not a 100% match, I'm sure there's an NES somewhere that looks exactly like this, so I'm not too worried about color matching. And hey, we're doing a custom job here, so any imperfections will be just a result of a happy accident. We don't make mistakes, we have happy accidents. The console has two tones of grey, one light, the other dark, and after setting up my makeshift paint booth, I went to town painting them. I was careful to apply the paint from a distance, doing several thinner layers to avoid the paint pooling in different areas, and I was especially worried about those vent type ridges on the top, but in the end it ended up looking rather nice in my opinion. I've also put a couple of layers of clear coat in between, just to protect the paint and keep my fingerprints off it. I didn't paint the inside portion of the plastics, apart from the front cover and those black plastic bits, and once I had it all finished, it was time to assemble this unique Nintendo PC for the final time. When possible, I utilized the existing screw posts, and I also got creative and, well, attaching various bits to the post when they didn't match, just with some custom brackets and zip ties. And while it looks kinda chaotic, you won't be able to see any of this when I close the unit up. I just used some random screws I had of appropriate length and size to hold the unit together. And once I closed it up, I mean, just look at it. <laughs> now say that's not the coolest thing you've seen today. Well, depending on what you saw, I mean, it might not be. I don't know, maybe you just came back from freaking Disneyland. I don't know. But either way, it's pretty doggone gorgeous in my opinion. Now, as far as what will actually run on here, well, there's no way in hell I'm leaving that Windows 10 installation on here, and if you've seen my OS testing video I did with these, you understand. But I also initially didn't want to use macOS with like an emulator, since this really was a crossbreed between a console and a computer, and yeah, you could absolutely argue that a modern console is in itself a computer with a different operating system, so I wanted to get close to that, and what better way of doing it than to run a custom Linux build tailored to retro games. I'm talking of course about Betosera, an operating system I've seen in action many times but I've never actually installed it myself, so this was a perfect opportunity. But I ran into some issues when trying to get it installed since this particular unit supports a core duo system which doesn't support UEFI, something that this particular distro requires. And it's kinda dumb since I actually do have a Mac Mini I've upgraded to a Core 2 Duo CPU that's clocked at like 2.5 GHz, but I didn't bother to use that one in this case since I didn't think I'd need to. And lord have I tried everything, all sorts of different distros, making like a dozen different bootable USBs and discs, installing a custom boot menu, but nope, just didn't want to do it. So I've settled on Snow Leopard, which is an OS I really enjoy, and when I was a teen I actually used to play a ton of emulated games using things like Nestopia here, so that's another dose of nostalgia right there. 
But you don't have to limit yourself to just NES titles, since this thing will do N64 and PS1 emulation no problem. And you can hook up another USB controller, since, yeah, playing that with an NES controller is yeah, interesting. <laughs> Granted, it would have been cooler with all the custom menus of the Bat of Sarah, but even with all that said, I mean, this is awesome. And you can, of course, even hook it up to your living room TV, and heck, I'd say this handily beats the NES Classic. And since it does run a standard OS, you can also use it just to like a media player, which is what I intend to do. And I mean, it's the coolest looking media player that I have, and it fits my game room great. And you can even boot up some mid-2000s Mac and Windows classics if you're so inclined. And this is something that you can totally build yourself, and probably even do a better job than me, and for less money than you can get the actual NES Mini nowadays, probably. So if you like tinkering with 3D printed parts and electronics, I encourage you to give this a shot. And if you don't have a 3D printer or you just like some awesome quality prints delivered to your door, GLC 3DP has got you covered. I'll leave all the links to the models I've used as well as a link to GLC 3DP, so make sure you check them out. And if you like these sorts of projects, make sure you check out some of my other videos. I did a Mac Pro Mini and a Macintosh Mini along with all sorts of other nerdy tech projects. If you like what I do, you can support me on Patreon. I post all my videos there first, and I usually have a couple on there for my supporters to see first. It's only one buck a month. Also, if you'd like to chat with me and other users, you can join our Discord server. All the links will be in the video description. Thanks, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers.